the meaning of marriage, this is part three, why this whole series won't do some people any good. And I have two thoughts. I don't, unless I'm overly optimistic, I don't think it'll be long. Some things in the Christian life, though, are so important, they're just, they're not just thoughts, they're not just ideas, they become axioms. They're, 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 they're truths that are just always true and have to always be kept in place before anything else works. I have in my office a little plastic puzzle and there's a blue marble. It's a plexiglass thing that I got a long time ago. And you take it apart into about six pieces and you take the marble out. And it's kind of like a Rubik's Cube. You put the marble in and you put the pieces back together. And what I learned after a while was there's a couple pieces you have to have in place first. And if you do everything else right but get the order wrong and forget those two key pieces, there's no way of making it work. If I had the voice and if I thought it would help, I would shout the two points. I just think they're so foundational. If books and videos and conferences on marriages created good marriages, if retreats and seminars and DVDs created good marriages, this would be an era in the church where marriages were thriving. But that's not the case. Right now, right now the divorce rate, both in the church and out of the church, because there is no difference statistically anymore. The divorce rate, taken on the whole, Christians and atheists, is just under two-thirds. What that means is, the next time you're at a wedding in our church, right here in this sanctuary, and there are two people standing here getting married, it doesn't matter who they are or how long they've been coming to the church. The next time you're at a wedding at Cedarview Community Church, the couple right here, the safe money is on their divorce, not on their marriage. So something's happened. Now what this should do is make those of us who are married tremendously thankful and tremendously careful in our marriages. And for those who are still single, learn now, learn now to treasure Christ more than you plan to love your future spouse, because that's the only way to enter into a lifelong marriage. You get ready now for marriage best, not by attending seminars on marriage, but by yielding your life totally to Christ and being devoted to him in all things. Marriages don't end right away. There are no safe times for any marriage. Couples don't plan for their marriages to end when they're dancing together at their receptions. And the marriages that grow and thrive do so because the husband and the wife grow their marriage with God's help. The best marriage will start to wilt the moment people start to coast. Now all of this leads us to the issue at hand. Isn't... isn't Father God loving toward the marriages of his children? Aren't there books and seminars and counselors and conferences aplenty? And if so, what's gone wrong? And if we can know what has gone wrong, then why can't we seem to fix it? And this, it seemed to me, was an appropriate question to look at right near the beginning of this series. The text is Hebrews 13, verses 4 to 6. 
Hebrews 13, 4 to 6. If you have your Bibles, look it up. That way you get to know where it is in your Bible. You can underline things in your Bible. There's no substitute for following in your Bible. Hebrews 13, 4 through 6. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. If I can't imagine this is the case, but if no one's ever told you this before, God's plan for your life sexually is abstinence before marriage and fidelity after marriage, and that has never changed. For God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. And I want to just do some preliminary work with that text before we get into the two main points. First, the writer requires a certain mindset, a certain commitment to marriage in general. It's right in that first phrase in verse 4. Marriage is to be held in honor among all. And then the next phrase, he'll deal with sexual immorality and how it defiles and destroys marriage. But that's not what he's talking about in the first phrase. He's saying... Marriage is to be held in honor among all. He's saying that everybody, single or married, is to have a certain reverence for marriage. And this reverence needs to be visible. It needs to be displayed. This, this high, lofty picture of marriage and what it is becomes the common air that the church is to breathe. It's the attitude that everyone in the community of God is to hold toward it. Let it be held by all. And let's be careful as we read here. He's not saying Christians are to hold their spouse in honor. That's true, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about any particular husband or wife in this command about marriage being held in honor. He's talking about this, the mental air that the church breathes. He's, he's calling for an attitude toward marriage that is becoming more and more distinctly countercultural. And he's pleading that it not be abandoned in the body of Christ. You don't honor marriage if you view it as the road to self-fulfillment. You don't honor marriage if you view it as disposable. You don't honor marriage if you view it as open in terms of including other partners. You don't honor marriage if you see the terms of marriage, and we're going to look at this a lot next week, as being definable by human authority and human law. No, we the church, and I don't just mean the married people in the church, we exalt marriage. That doesn't mean if you're single, you're a second-rate Christian or a second-rate citizen or a second-rate member of the body of Christ. What it does mean is you still have an honorable view of marriage, whether you're married or not. We defend it. We lift marriage high above our own happiness and our own fulfillment. We see it as something God-given and God-defined. We honor marriage. Let marriage be held in honor by everybody. Now, the second thing, in terms of background information on this text, is God says, God says he will judge those who are sexually immoral. It's in verse 4. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. And, and it used to be that Christians couldn't read words like that without thinking about them. But that's not the case anymore. Those days are gone. Too many Christians, or at least professing Christians, don't feel threatened in any way by the judgment of God 
when they sin. They tell themselves and others they still believe in Jesus or they still love Jesus. And they're free to pursue their own desires with immunity to rejecting the clear commands of Father God. And these words, these warning words, are written not to the world, but to the church. They're written to a group of people who may be right on the edge of believing that because their sins are covered by grace, nothing happens to them when they continue in sin. They're written to a group of people who may be on the edge of believing that because their sins are erased through the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ on the cross, then Father God just lovingly allows them to pursue their own agenda without outside interference. And that is not the case. I want to just say as lovingly and as firmly as I know how. I know none of us is perfect. I understand that. But if that's your attitude, if you have it anywhere in the back of your head and you're somehow trying to convince yourself that because you at one time professed some kind of faith in Christ and if you have it in your head that you can willfully commit known sin after claiming saving grace, then all I can say is you're not saved. You're not a Christian. Well, that's pretty strong, Pastor Don. What right do you have to say that? Well, because, because my Bible tells me what saving grace does. The grace of God has appeared and it teaches everyone to deny fleshly lusts. See, I've experienced God's grace. Well, if you have, what that grace does is it doesn't just erase your past sins. What it does is, is it takes your heart and says, I would, I would cut off my hand before I would grieve the Lord. Now, those are two basic background points in our text. Marriage is to be honored by everybody, and God judges the sexually immoral. Now to the main point. Why this whole series won't do some people any good. Two thoughts. One. Biblical truth will never be heard by people who desire something else more than they desire to do the will of Father God. I know that's an involved sermon point, but when you take the time to dig, it's set out clearly in our text. Look at it again, Hebrews 13, 4 to 6. Let marriage be held in honor among all. Let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say the Lord is my helper. Now, there's, there's a setup, there's a structure of that text that is not accidental. It's not accidental that these words about contentment, they're right in verse 5. The words about contentment in the middle of that passage, they form, they're sandwiched right between the command to honor marriage And they're followed immediately by the promise of God's supernatural help and intervention. So you have these instructions about marriage in verse 4. You have the promise of God's help in verse 6. And you have the command to be content in verse 5. In other words, nothing will make anything God says seem less appealing less applicable, less possible to his children than an inner disposition of discontent.
the truth, the truth that is perfectly obvious to me, the spiritual truth that is perfectly obvious to my heart when I look at someone else's sin, is never obvious to me when I choose to sin. Because when I choose to sin, there's something I desire more than I desire pleasing God. In other words, I'm discontent with God's will for my life. And the revelation of what he says doesn't seem best to me anymore. That's why I can look at your life when you sin and think, how in the world could he be so blind? But when I'm interested in that same sin, the truth that was so obvious when I saw it in your heart isn't so obvious to me anymore. What happened? I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you what happened. Spiritual discontent makes me the most unteachable person on the face of the earth. Spiritual discontent makes me the most unteachable person on the whole earth. And so the point the writer is making to these Christians is is simple, though it's a bit humbling to face. If there's any situation in my life, including my difficult marriage, because that's the immediate context of those words. Anything about my difficult marriage, my marriage situation, if there's anything where I want something else more than I want to obey Father God, then I will never be able to hear or receive God's help. Discontented people are the most unteachable people on planet Earth. Haven't you ever witnessed this? Have you ever have you ever had somebody close to you or somebody you know or maybe someone in the church and you see them and they make a mess of their life and you step back and you say, how could he have done that? He's been listening to the word. He's been hearing truth for 20 years. How can he not see what he's doing? Have you ever asked yourself that question? How can he not see this? And the answer relates to what we were talking about this morning. To him who has not, even what he has will be taken away from him. You're looking at that person thinking, he's got 20 years of accumulated spiritual walk and wisdom, and he's doing something so dumb, how can that be? And the answer is, no, he doesn't have those anymore. It's scary. That's been taken From him. Why? Because he's discontent with what God is revealing. There's something else he wants more. We need to just drill down deeper. There's only two points, and we're almost done the first one. The opposite of contentment, of course, is covetousness. I can be covetous of wealth, that will keep me from hearing God, and it will destroy my marriage. I can be covetous of another partner. That will keep me from hearing God and it will destroy my marriage. I can be covetous of my freedom. That will keep me from hearing God and it will destroy my marriage. But the basic root problem in all of those cases and dozens more is exactly the same. If at some point, especially in my marriage, if there's something I've set my heart on more than I set my heart on doing the will of God, no matter how difficult that might appear to be, then at that point, I render God's help impossible. And there's not a one of us that doesn't just, that doesn't every night Not a one of us who doesn't need to kneel by his or her bed and just pray for a persistent, submissive contentment with the will of God that just keeps my soul's ears 
open to his voice and my marriage open to his supernatural intervention and help. That leads into the second point. The less people are willing to agree with God about their marriage, the more they will be convinced they already know what they're doing. The less people are willing to agree with God about their marriage, the more they will be convinced they already know what they're doing. And here we stand right on the threshold of just an absolute principle. It's like the law of gravity, an absolute principle of deterioration. Here it is. The more people don't listen to God the more they will become convinced that they already know enough. Or I word it even better in the notes. The more people don't listen to God, the more they will think they already know. That says it even better. The more people don't listen to God, the more they will think they already know. This is always true. 100% of the time. And that's why... That's why information alone, digesting books and pamphlets and and counseling sessions about marriage, won't correct spiritual problems in a marriage. Now, don't misunderstand me. There are some marriage problems that can be totally turned around by counseling sessions and seminars and information. There's a couple mourning over the tragic death of a baby. A couple struggling with bad financial management. The spouse needing medical treatment for clinical depression. These kind of problems and scores like them, they desperately need that kind of outside help. But let me just tell you, most of the marriage situations I encounter in this church don't come anywhere near under this heading. Nine times out of ten, marriages are suffering because of the spiritual rebellion of one or both of the partners. And then, to dodge the helping grace that God would bring into that marriage, they start to tell themselves lies. We were never right for each other in the first place. We never should have gotten married. Our vows don't count. I've heard it all. And because, and because... The more we don't listen to God, the more we think we already know, it gets very hard to convince them otherwise. And the person who, if you had talked to them a year ago and pointed out the same sin in their lives before they were caught up in it, they would have agreed with you. But now it's them and they're discontent with their marriage and they want something else more than they want the will of God. Now they can't understand what you're talking about. You're speaking Latin to them when you talk about the spiritual problems in their marriage. What I'm calling for in this series, and we're we're done, we're going to deal with all sorts of subjects. All sorts of subjects. But what I'm calling for in all of our hearts as a church is just the the carefulness of the saints. The idea that you might have if you're a single person and and you're thinking somewhere about marriage and you've grown up in the church, maybe you've both grown up in the church, and the idea that somehow you're going to get married and you're going to build a walk with Jesus that is somehow bigger and stronger than the relationship with Jesus that you bring into that marriage. That's a myth. That's a myth. All marriage does is magnify your spiritual weaknesses. And if you really want to get ready for marriage, 
then there's just nothing more important for you right now than to start immediately loving Jesus more than you love the person you're planning to marry. And if you want to keep your marriage strong and you're a married person, then you practice right now loving Jesus more than you love your spouse. I've said it a thousand times because the only time your love for your spouse, your partner is safe is when it's not in first place. When you put it in first place, you will ruin it. But if you have two people and they're going to get married and if instead of looking at each other this way, if you have two people and they're both looking to the Lord and they're both moving, honoring the Lord, wanting to please the Lord and obey the Lord, they just get closer and closer to each other all the way and you discover something precious. And above all, Practice contentment with the will of Father God. Practice it. Practice shutting out immediately all competing desires and affection. Practice doing God's will, especially in the areas where it seems almost impossible to do it. That is the very best way I know of to enter marriage or stay in marriage with a godly heart. As far as I can tell, in fact, that's the only way to get a deep marriage that'll last you until Jesus comes again. Creation starts with a marriage, Adam and Eve. The book of Revelation ends with the ultimate marriage of which my marriage to my wife is only supposed to be a brief picture. The marriage between Christ and his bride. Between those two marriages, the only way they're kept strong There isn't enough information. There aren't enough seminars, conferences, and books. The only way they are kept strong is as couples together look toward the Lamb. And when you desire God's will more than you desire anything else, there is nothing that can tear your marriage apart. See, God's will is the safest place for your marriage. Cherish the will of God. Practice it in little things, and it'll be so much easier to honor it in big things. And everyone said...